according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me one more time, if you would, in Genesis chapter 2. I thought we might be in chapter 3 by now, but we have some final details we need to uh, wrap up in the last two verses of Genesis chapter 2. It is not good for the man to be alone, and God provided for him in his not good provision by giving him a good provision, the provision of a woman. And uh, this is where we were a week ago, and we saw the procedure that was uh, brought about to not just take a different section of dirt from Adam's section of dirt and make a separate being, but actually to take from within Adam himself, to remove the bone from within Adam himself, so that he is able to compose the first, uh, the first hymn of the Bible when he says, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. And this is uh, critical, actually. It gets mentioned repeatedly through the New Testament, the order of their creation and the purpose for her existence. She was brought to him. She was created for his sake. He was not created for her sake. Now, that's a monodirectional doctrine that we have to recognize. It only goes one direction. She was created for his sake his not good alone circumstance that God remedied. So we left off with that. I want to get right back to it again today. There's principles here that apply generationally to a generation that leaves father and mother and cleaves to one another and the two become one flesh. They were naked. They were not ashamed. And uh, so we've got to, we've got to do some naked study here today to see what this is, uh, what this is about. All right. Before we do that, though, let's take a moment for silent prayer, calling upon our Father and His faithfulness to bless our time of study. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we do come before you this morning thankful for your faithfulness, thankful for grace and truth, and rejoicing, Father, in the doctrine that you're blessing us with, right from the, the opening book, the opening chapters, the opening words of your written revelation, Father. We thank you that we have the depths of doctrine right from the beginning. We have uh, impact uh, in so many realms of theology, Father. And uh, we recognize that far too many people just discount this or consider it uh, Sunday school material or children's stories or anything, mythology, things that, and, and they just dismiss the depths of doctrine that come out of Genesis that's so foundational. Father, I pray that we, uh, that we tremble in fear before you, that we have reverence before your word, that we not dismiss what you have given to us, Father, that these fundamental doctrines are, are absolutely essential or none of us are saved. Father, if there is no first Adam, then how can we be redeemed by the second Adam? And theologically, doctrinally, biblically, we, uh, we're dealing with so many critical issues in this, in this text. Father, we're also dealing with issues that are hated and attacked uh, marriage and family and gender roles and nationalism, so much of the laws of divine establishment that come back to Genesis, um, they're absolutely hated in our postmodern culture today. So I pray, Father, as we uh, study to show ourselves approved, that you would keep us well grounded in the, uh, the solid foundation, the rock of your truth. And we do thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, and so... As we were working our way through, and I just remembered, I stashed my notes earlier. I'm sorry? Am I sharing my screen? I am not sharing my screen? Okay. Thank you. Sometimes this turns itself off. Are you seeing it now? Okay. Okay. There we go. Was it running last hour for, for Dan's message? Oh, okay. All right. This is the magic that the Lord blessed us with that allows my screen to not only go up there to the projector where you guys can see it, but it goes back to her computer so she can put it on, on the website, on YouTube, and wherever else it goes. All right, so Genesis chapter 2. And the man was alone, and the man was given commands. And part of what we're going to discuss when we get into the fall next week with chapter 3, the woman wasn't around yet when God was giving the instructions. And so it is, it is a question as to once she comes on the scene then, 
did, did the Lord repeat himself so that she could hear it directly from him? Or was Adam responsible to convey the, uh, the, the message? And was this his first duty as a, as a Bible teacher to reveal to the woman what it was that the Lord had told him about uh, the tree that they couldn't eat from? And, uh, and so it's not entirely clear. Uh, I think there's speculation, however you handle it, uh, because you have to have some kind of an assumption that's not in the text uh, or you just let it go and not worry about it. But she does add a requirement that God never said anything about touching the tree. And when she was explaining things to the serpent, she said, we can't eat from it, we can't touch it, uh, or else we're going to die. And so uh, here's a, just a quick preview, because we'll be dealing with this when we get into chapter 3 next week. But it's not clear that uh, she got that from the Lord, or she got that from Adam, or that she made that up herself. Where did that touching thing come from? In, uh, in her statement to the serpent. So stay tuned, and, and at least you can, you can uh, chew on it and think about it in, uh, in the coming days. But, so uh, the man is alone as he's given this command, and then, after naming the animals, God uh, brings him the woman. And you can imagine, uh, if every animal God brought him, Adam would say, this is now a goat. This is now an elephant. This is now a, a giraffe, or, or what have you. And each time an animal was brought to him, Adam would have a this is now statement. And whatever the man called the animal, that was its name. God had delegated that duty. God is not going to micromanage. God doesn't come by Adam and say, you know, uh, it's kind of a dumb name. Can you pick something else, right? God went with whatever Adam gave for the, the name of that animal. And that was his delegated responsibility. The, uh, but then he brings the woman. And now Adam has more naming to do. And so, uh, where we left off last week, of course, the Lord God, in verse 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs, or a bone of an uncertain nature, that the scholars will debate for, until uh, eternity, I think. But he took a, uh, a, uh, a rib, or a, a side thing, and closed up the flesh at that place, and the Lord God fashioned, or built it's a brand new verb. It's not a verb for creation or molding or shaping or any of the, it's not bara or asa or yatser or any of the verbs we've seen up till now for, uh, for creating or forming or making. This is a verb for building. So he built a woman, the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And then the man said, what we have here in verse 23 is the first recorded statement. The first recorded statement of the man. Let me get my slideshow caught up here. Adam's first recorded words. Now he had said other things prior to this because there were all the animals that he named. And the Lord brought the animals and, and the Lord, you know, Adam named them and there was conversation. We know there was conversation in that exercise. It's just not recorded for us in the book of, of Genesis. The first recorded words. The first quotation or citation that we have whereby uh, man speaks and, uh, and it gets written down for us in the Bible is this uh, song. The first recorded words are a song. And I find that interesting. And we've got, of course, we just saw Doug and we have musicians here. And it's how creative is it when, when human beings created in God's image get to be creative in, uh, in the writing of lyrics and the, the composition of, of, of melody and and harmony and everything else that goes with writing a song. So this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is now. And there was no other animal that was ever brought to him where he could say, this is corresponding to me. You know, there was no animal that was bone of his bones or flesh of his flesh. There was no animal that was corresponding to him because even though they came from the dirt, they came from different dirt, from Adam. They're not in Adam. The animal realm is not the human realm. The human realm is the realm that's in, that's uh, created in the image and likeness of God. And so we understand our biblical anthropology is pretty different from the cosmos system. And if you take an anthropology class in college today, I, you know, sorry about that, but it's just a sad class because it's all evolution. It's all, you know, goo to you by way of the zoo. And it's all the, we're on the tree of life with the animals as if we are an animal when we are not. And so we keep things biblical in the process of this, uh, of this class. So she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Her origin, her source came from him. And so this, this is true of, of her purpose. This is true of her judgment. This is true of her accountability. 
This is why, even though she sinned first, she, her eyes were not immediately opened. She did not become spiritually dead at eating the fruit. It was not until Adam ate the fruit that then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, together, spiritually dead, knew that they were naked. Okay? Preview, I'm giving it away, but we'll be there uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. And so her origin and her source come from him. Her position, her estate, her, her destiny, her judgment, her accountability, all of that is centered in being in Adam. Okay? This is long before in Adam all die. But it was in Adam that Eve was, was operating here as the helper corresponding to him. Now, um, he goes on to say, because she was taken out of man. And, and Paul will comment on this. And in Corinthians, we have this as the principle. It also comes up in 1 Timothy 2, why a woman doesn't teach or exercise authority over a man. It's because the man was created first, she was created for his sake, and the man was not deceived. That's, that's the, the impact in 1 Timothy chapter 2. All right, but the position there, and it's the only time it's ever happened, because from this moment on, okay, every other man that ever walks the face of this earth uh, he had his birth through a woman, okay? That's, that's, that's universal, that uh, there's never been a man since Adam that uh, arrived on this earth apart from the birthing process of, of a human woman. And so uh, the, the, the first sets the, uh, is the exception for the rule that, uh, that follows. All right, then we have for this reason, for this reason. And the, probably the most important words of uh, verse 24 are for this reason. And they're, they're the least commented upon by any commentary you ever read in Genesis. Because the commentaries want to get right to leaving and cleaving and they want to talk about um, different aspects of, of things. But really it's the for this reason that grabs my attention. Because this forms a theological basis for the, the uh, transition of generations. This forms the theological basis of a son who leaves his father's house and who takes a bride. And we have the very first example here, and, and, and it's given as a for this reason statement, that God wants us to not lose the theology in the story, and that we have to realize that part of the blessings of humanity is that we get to portray a begetter and a begotten one something that the angels do not do, angels cannot do. Angels do not marry nor are given a marriage. Angels do not beget, not uh, among themselves. There's no girl angels that we see anywhere in the Bible, okay? The only time we see there's a perversion when fallen angels mate with human women and they produce Nephilim, crossbreed, you know, hybrid uh, uh, abominations, and, and that's what brings about the flood, and we'll, we'll be there uh, soon enough when we get to chapter 6. But apart from that abomination, apart from that intrusion in, uh, into the human race, the angels themselves, they don't marry nor are given a marriage. They don't procreate. They don't propagate. There's no girl angels. Anytime they manifest in the physical universe, they're always called men. And they appear as men. And they eat as men. And they travel as men. And, and when they violate the will of God, they fornicate as men. Okay? But the blessing we have in the image of God, when we're told male and female, He created them, when we're told that God blessed them, is that humanity now has the, the uh, blessing to proclaim a begetter and a begotten one. And each generation gets to do this, a begetter and a begotten one. And we get to, to portray clearly in the, in the typology God the Father and God the Son, and then the delight of the Father providing a bride for His Son, what we appreciate in our doctrine of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, the bride for the, for the Son of God. Anyway, there's, uh, there's a lot of theology that goes into the for this reason, and it centers in the, the not good circumstance of, of Adam's being alone. It's, it centers in nothing else in this creation is a helper suitable for him, and that only God, God is the only being who can bring something out of nothing. God is the only being who can create. God is the only provision for the not good, lacking circumstance. So many fundamental doctrines that come out of this. But a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Again, the, 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 the foundation of this is the exception. The rule follows. 
Adam never had to leave father and mother, uh, didn't grow up. He wasn't a baby. He didn't grow to a man. He was created a man. But from the, the first point of, of Cain and Abel, from the, the very first birthed generation on this earth, when, when the, the boy becomes a man and steps forth in his own adult generation or his own generational accountability before the Lord as an adult man, he is to take a wife and the two. This is the, uh, the pattern here for marriage. So they cleave to one another, they're joined to his wife, and this is what I want to stress. And I, and I, I touched upon it last week, but I really thought um, I tend to, to speak faster after noon and uh, because I know that between noon and 12.15, that's all I've got, and I'm running out of time. Uh, and so I thought maybe if I, if I started with this this morning, long before noon, that I can be speaking a little bit slower to walk us through here. So Adam and Eve didn't have parents to leave. They didn't have to leave home, and, and they were created as adults, right? But they do set the pattern for what happens when a child becomes an adult and leaves home. This is, uh, this is what we're dealing with. So we're talking about the uh, passing of a generation. God established the Genesis account of woman's origin as the basis for marriage and sex. God established the Genesis account of woman's origin as the basis for marriage and sex. And it's in that order, by the way, that the marriage, the joining comes first, the identification and the loyalty come first. So again, we're going to be looking here at the details from verses 24 and 25. Jesus himself cited this passage when he was uh, avoiding one of their divorce traps they were laying for him. They, they, they felt they could trap him into choosing one of the two dominant schools of his generation, and he just thwarted them both and took it back to, to Genesis and left them speechless. Also a phrase in Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 4, where it's called the marriage bed. That's, there's a reason for that title. But this is the basis. All right, so leaving father and mother. A man shall leave. This is not uh, abandonment. This is not neglect. This is not you never see him again for the rest of your life on this earth. You, uh, you will likely see him frequently for the rest of his life on this earth. If all things being normal, uh, you will outlive him. But uh, all other things, you will leave as a matter of what? As a matter of dependence? as a matter of duty before the Lord, because this, this all centers on the image of God glorifying the Father and the Son. And so there is a time, there is a season whereby your Father and you, you're portraying the begetting and the begotten, but then a t the time comes that that duty is complete. You are raised, you are born and raised, you're ready now to step forth. And now in your generation, you're going to take a wife and you're going to repeat the process. All right, And you're going to retell that story of a, bego of a begetter and a begotten one. And you're going to be passing on. In fact, this is part of what we do as we are training up the, the children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And so the, this blessing then, so when you leave a father and mother, that means you are leaving their authority, you're leaving their uh, Bible teaching, you're leaving their spiritual dominion over you, you're establishing a new spiritual dominion that is in the divine institution of marriage. And this is where two become one, and you've got two parties in this that become one in this new generation of husband and wife. And so the joining, when it says be joined to his wife, that's not sex. Uh, you don't get to sex until you get the they shall be one flesh. The joining precedes the sex. The joining is the commitment, is the covenant, is the, is the unity between the one man and the one woman that are from that moment on, they're walking as heirs together of the grace of life. That's the joining. And it is a covenant. It is a, it is a sacred joining. And God's the one himself that does it. That's why the, the divorce command is so serious. What God has joined together, let no man separate. And so leaving... <laughs> used to be with King James, you could have leaving and cleaving. But um, in the New American Standard, anyway, it's leave and be joined to. This is for emotional, uh, spiritual. Um, this is, this is the, the, the personal unity of two people that identify now as one. S mutual interests, mutual goals, mutual objectives, mutual work assignments in the, uh, the joining of a man and a woman. And so this is then the foundation. As Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter 19, 
They were coming to him and trying to get him to answer their debate questions related to divorce. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And then you have the school of Hillel, the school of Shammai. They had different views, and uh, they're trying to get him to pick one side over another. Honestly, I don't think they cared which side he picked, because whichever way he went, then they could attack him. But he answered and said, have you not read? <laughs> Our Savior, he was confrontational. He'd be, he'd be Facebook banned in a heartbeat, I think. Or I'd be... Because he didn't back down, and he used some of the most cutting words. You know, we get these, these, you know, it's like asking a PhD if he knows how to read. You know, he's been through school before. These guys are brilliant. They're well-educated. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And then what does he do? He goes back and he restates that for this reason. For this reason. Don't lose the theology in the, in the story. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. This is the, the dedication, the devotion, the unity, the, uh, the covenant binding of one man and one woman as heirs together of the grace of life. And the two shall be one flesh. This is the copulation activity of, of the sexual relations in marriage. The two shall become one flesh. What, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Now, they remain two separate individuals, but positionally, they are one. They are one person, one in name, one in purpose, one in reputation. What God has joined together, let no man separate. It's the basis. And of course, our world just has this all messed up. Anything Satan does, anything, even without Satan, human sin will mess up God's design every time. And... Um, we have it there. To me, one of the most profound verses is Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. This is taking the same two steps that Genesis 2 was taking. To be joined to one another, that's the marriage. The two shall be one flesh, that's the marriage bed. And as a matter of fact, as a biblical name for um, I mean, think about why do we have so many names for, for the sex act? I mean, it's insane. And it's, it's probably a feature of all language, really. You find euphemisms, you find ways to, to get around the issue, to say something without saying it. And then before you know it, now we've got five ways to say it, six ways to say it, a hundred ways to say it. And some are crude and vulgar and some are profane. But there's different ways to talk about the man and the woman and the one flesh activity. But this is the simplest way, I think, and then the Bible lays it out here. It's called the marriage bed. You understand why it's a problem if you're not married and yet you're participating in a marriage bed? This is, it's fundamental to, to um, God's design. And then it goes on to say, for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Two categories, double judgment. All right? Fornication is the sexual sin. Fornication is, is, uh, is anything beyond marriage, outside of marriage, extra. Wait, anytime you put an attachment in front of it, okay, it's, it's just not marriage. Okay? Premarital is not marital. Extramarital is not marital. But the idea is fornication is the physical side. Adultery. Don't think that adultery is the same thing. Oh, well, it's just a subcategory. It's a, adultery is the same thing as fornication. No, it's not. They're different things. It is the violation of the, of the marriage covenant. It's the violation of the be joined to his wife. Okay? And really, the ideal is one, not polygamy, not wives, plural, but uh, that's a different sermon. But the idea is, is one man, one woman, they're going to form the pattern because it's the two of them together. She is the helper corresponding to him. And so fornication is the sexual sin. Adultery is the violation of the marriage, of the joining. It's the same two issues that we have in, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall be one flesh. Well, where does this leave the single man? Where does this leave the bachelor? What about the guy that's you know, he's, uh, 
you, he's got to finish his degree. He's got to he's got to have a career established. He's got to own a home. He's got to have um, he's got to have uh, a certain uh, uh, savings in the in the uh, in the bank account. He's, he, all that stuff's got to be grounded first before he's ever going to be ready for marriage. Wait a minute. Are we talking biblically here? Or are we talking culturally? And if we're talking culture, let's ask ourselves, how far has our culture departed from the biblical norm? See? <laughs> so, now it's out. And I'm on camera. And everyone's witnessing. The pastor is in favor of arranged marriages. And, uh... <laughs> no. But... It wouldn't be a terrible thing if we did go back to that. I'm just saying. Um, I can't wave a magic wand and force the United States of America to go back to that kind of a thing. But if somehow that did happen someday, I wouldn't lament it, honestly. I think that we would, um, we would improve a lot of things from generation to generation. And, uh, you know, I've seen... It's, 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 it's a marvelous thing when... Um, because parenthood is a blessing that forces some growing up to do, right? If if you know, now you gotta you gotta raise this child, and there's man, there's a duty, there's a responsibility, there's a uh, there's a sense that God is is holding you accountable to raise this next generation, and and you do. I mean, my dad was a, was a moron until I became a parent, and then my dad was a genius <laughs> overnight. As soon as Bob was born, I wanted to ask my dad, you know. What, what now and what next and, and, and all these things in any, in any event. So grow up sooner, raise up a generation, don't fool around with a bunch of garbage and nonsense and damage that, you, that you're going to take into your marriage of when you eventually get there at some point uh, because in all these intervening years you were, you were uh, with the pigs out there in the, like the prodigal in, uh, in pig land. All right. Back to uh, Genesis then. So for this reason, a man shall leave his father, his mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right. So a lot of commentaries on this. And we'll talk about this, the principles of nakedness. I think the partly we read this and we say, well, big deal. Who cares? I mean, what's the problem being naked if you're the only people in the world, right? There's no other people anywhere. It's just you and a bunch of animals. What do they care, right? It's just, if you're the only people in the world, and it's perfect environment, perfect weather, there's no sin yet, there's no... So, you know, I read this and I think, well, I'd probably do the same thing. I mean, who cares, Right? But here's the principle, okay? If, we, if we're flipping about it or if we, if we don't think it through, okay? And, and it's hard to imagine, well, did Adam have a house? Where did he live? Where did he sleep at night? What did they, you know, did, did he pitch a tent? Did he build a house? Um, we, 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 there's so much more that the Bible doesn't tell us, and we're just left to wonder. How long does this process take? Did he name every animal in, in, in the same day? Or did that take several days? And, and was the woman created on day six before the first day seven when God rested? Or did she not come about to the second week or third week or a month later? What was the... So when we're, we're trying to synchronize Genesis 1 with Genesis 2 with a precision that the text doesn't give us. So we don't know. And why were they naked? Why didn't they make clothes? Didn't they look around and see feathers and fur on the animals and birds and think, hey, that's probably pretty warm. Let's, you know, we, we, we ought to put something on here. But they were naked, and it doesn't say that they were warm enough or that they, they weren't embarrassed. It says they were not ashamed. And the, and the theology of this is, is hitting us because this is before sin. Without sin, there's no shame. And this is also the only passage anywhere in the Bible where nakedness is not a problem. Every other time you have nakedness, anywhere else in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere else, if somebody's naked, it's because something bad is going on. It's, it, even Song of Solomon, which glorifies marriage, marital sex, and all the things there, it's very graphic in the language that it uses. It never actually uses the word naked in Song of Solomon. Isn't that amazing? 
So the most erotic book of the, of the Bible never uses the word naked, which that's probably a commentary too on something else, but I'm going to let that go as well. I do want to talk about nakedness, and I want to talk about why it's a problem and, and why it stands, why this text here stands so distinct. Nakedness and shame are biblical themes with several applications. Nakedness and shame are biblical themes with several applications. Sometimes it's uh, your city's been conquered, you're being carried away in slavery, and so you're stripped in shame. Our Savior was stripped as He was hung on the cross. There's other uh, principles of shame, and even um, maybe the most shameful are the ones that humans have taught themselves not to be ashamed of. What God says is shameful, and we've grown rather comfortable with it. We've grown rather accustomed to it. And as a society and as a culture, we've lost capacity for shame in uh, things that uh, our parents, our grandparents, previous generations older than us, um, they wouldn't have even talked about it out, you know, out loud in, in uh, public or in mixed company or in even at all, <laughs> okay? There are things that ought not be talked about, not, ought not be spoken. And the Bible says that, things that ought not be spoken. And not only do we speak about them, we, we, they're, they're featured in our entertainment. They're, they're portrayed, they're displayed in so many ways. All right, so they were both naked, they were not ashamed. This, uh, I think, is the lack of shame reflects the lack of sin, but it also reflects the unity. It reflects the the position that they are joined. And since they are joined, since they are husband and wife, then there's no shame in being naked with your husband or your wife, all right? That, that's not, there's nothing to be shamed about. Marital sex is what God designed. And so there is one person on this planet that is entitled, that owns your nakedness. And I'm going to use that phrase repeatedly because the Bible uses that phrase repeatedly. Nakedness is proprietary. It's a possession. It belongs to somebody. It doesn't belong to everybody, okay? That's why we got celebrities and movie stars and Kardashians and all kinds of people that think <laughs> that their nakedness belongs to the whole world. And it doesn't, okay? As God has designed this. And the, uh, the members that we bestow more honor upon, the members that we bestow less honor upon, the, the, um, the purpose for clothing, the principles of modesty, the principles of attractiveness, the, um, all of this, biblically speaking, it all comes together in so many different applications, and yet when we communicate them biblically, <laughs> our children think we're insane, our culture thinks we're, we're out of our minds, that we're primitive, we're, old, we're, not, we're, we're worse than old-fashioned. We're downright caveman dinosaur types. And, you know, next thing you know, what do you expect when to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen? And, and there's just, the world doesn't understand that God gave us these things for our blessing, but also for, for His delight. Because we're going to see a lot of places God Himself is thrilled with the way that He dressed Israel with how he dressed his wife, okay? And this is the design, this is the beauty. If she's dressing for him and he helps her get dressed, that's great. And then he helps her get undressed, that's great too. But all of this is involved. And God himself does this when he dresses Israel. And we have the passages of Scripture that lay this all out for us. So naked and not ashamed. Naked and not ashamed. Not the... That naked and afraid, is that the, yeah, okay. I've never seen an episode of Naked and, Asha and Afraid, but they advertise it every year during Shark Week. So th that's how they get me. Every year I watch Shark Week, and every year they're promoting the week after Shark Week, which is the new season of, of Naked and Afraid. So, anyway. And it doesn't take long. They are already naked, but they're going to have an awareness of that nakedness and a problematic awareness of that nakedness in chapter 3. So let's take a look at that. Genesis 3, 
And as we scroll down, we see the first six verses here. We have the sin, we have the temptation, we have the dialogue. The Nahash, the serpent, was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And we're going to be detailing these things. Was this Nahash a zoological animal or was this Nahash a spirit being? We know it was Satan. More crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, and she's not freaked out by a talking snake, Again, we want more detail here than we're given. Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Okay, now that's fake news, right? The first example of fake news right there. And she falls for it. And she enters into this discussion with him. From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Okay, we don't know where she got that touching thing. Um, but it somehow, either Adam told her, because Adam, you know, maybe Adam was trying to help God out a bit in his conveying of the message. God said, don't eat it. So Adam told Eve, don't eat it. Don't even touch it. And that was just his little twist, his little uh, extra. But you can't add to the Word of God. You can't take away from the Word of God. If Adam added that, that's on him. But then the serpent said, you shall not die. So stay tuned. We'll be getting to this. God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now Satan is correct. Her eyes are closed. We'll see her eyes open here in a minute. Her eyes are closed. Now, not, not talking about physical eyes. And, and even spiritual eyes. We, we tend to think there's only two eyes. There's your physical eyes. There's your spiritual eyes. But we're going to have to work on this. Because they are sinless, they are innocent, they are perfect. I believe they are righteous. I believe that they have spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear. But they don't have discerning eyes. So in, in a sense, their spiritual eyes are slightly different than our spiritual eyes because we have spiritual eyes as believers, but they have to be trained to be discerning. It's through practice that our senses are trained to discern good and evil. Okay? This is why, again, the book of Hebrews gives us everything we need. Okay, to go back and understand this tree here in Genesis. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that it was desirable to make one wise. So she adds now a third description. When God made the trees, they were a delight to the eyes and they were good for food. Two descriptions of every tree God ever made. They were a delight to the eyes, they were good for food. But here, she now adds a third description. Hey, it's a delight to the eyes, it's good for food, and... It's desirable to make one wise because she's received a promise from somebody other than God. And she thinks that if she places her faith in the statement this Nachash said that she's going to have this wisdom. So it's desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate. Notice her eyes are not yet opened. They don't get open until he eats. She took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now the sequence of these verbs, I'm convinced, and I'll teach this. She took, she ate, she gave. She took, she ate, she gave. There's no motion, there's no traveling. I believe Adam was there the whole time. That he witnessed the entire discussion. He didn't know what to say, so he didn't say anything. Typical man, okay? And he let her argue with a snake. Think about it. How many deadbeat husbands are out there that don't really care what church their wife goes to, you know? Church isn't really their thing. You want to be spiritual, okay, whatever. He was probably just waiting to go to Applebee's for lunch or something after church. He was wanting to, I don't know what he was doing, was a football game on? But he was there the whole time and didn't say a word. So she took, she ate, she gave. That, that immediate sequence. She didn't have to travel anywhere. It doesn't say she got up and left and went looking for him. She found him in the garden and whatever. She didn't call out saying, Adam, where are you? You know, the Lord's going to do that here shortly. But she, he was right there. <coughs> he ate. Notice, when he ate, then the eyes of both of them were opened. The eyes of both of them were opened. She did not become a sinner on the basis of her own personal sin. She became a, a sinner in Adam on the basis of Adam's original sin. Same way you and I became sinners. By being in Adam, the consequence of Adam's original sin. 
Remember, she's also in Adam, just as we are. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. This didn't make them naked, but this gave them the discernment as a perspective for sinful nakedness. Beforehand, it was sinless nakedness. Now it's sinful nakedness. And now they want to cover up. So they sew fig leaves together, made for themselves loin coverings. Notice, not just clothes, loin coverings. The issue they have is with the loins. All right, so stay tuned because there's going to be more on that. When we get down to verses 10 and 11, though, so the Lord God, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Uh Uh-oh. Garage door opener just opened. Dad's home. Okay? You can hear it before you see it, and you realize it's it's, it's the Lord God. We're sinners. He's holy and we're not. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Again, Eve didn't have to do this. I think he was was right there. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. In chapter 2, they were naked but not ashamed. Here, they're naked and afraid. Just like Discovery Channel. And I love the question in verse 11. He doesn't dispute that they're naked. Obviously, you're naked. It's like, yeah, you're human, you're male, you're female, you're naked. I know, that's how I made you. Okay? But the question is, who told you you were naked? Who have you been talking to? Where are you going for your spiritual information? Is there an alternative source from the the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth? Besides the God of truth, are you listening to the father of lies? Who are you talking to? Who told you that you were naked? And then second question, because I mean these questions answer themselves. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, God knows all the answers. He's omniscient. He's, he's not answering questions. He's like a good uh, an attorney in court or a, a, a police investigator with a suspect. Um, never ask a question that you don't already know the answer right? Always know the answer that you're asking. You just want to get it from them and then trap them into some lie and something else and then, then you got them, okay? My, my goal, without being a pastor, I wanted to be a homicide investigator and I, I had years of watching Columbo and practicing my, my play stupid routine. I'm pretty pleased with the fact that I can play dumb very well. <laughs> it's a natural, not even an act most of the time. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? Now he knows the answers. The reason why they're afraid. See, perfect love casts out all fear. If if they're not sinners, they they wouldn't be afraid. So he knows they've eaten. He knows anything. He's omniscient. Who told you that you were naked? So we have the Genesis 2, sinless nakedness. Genesis 3, sinful nakedness. The next nakedness is after the flood in Genesis chapter 9. And this is after the flood, and they're off the ark, and Noah plants a vineyard. Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. Drank the wine. I mean, it seems like a smart thing to do. Look, you just survived for a whole year on the boat with your kids and these animals. Get off the ark and plant a vineyard. I'm up for that. But then... He drank of the wine and became drunk. Again, we don't know what changes there might have been in the environment, uh, pre-flood, post-flood, what the nature of fermentation was like, but we don't, there's so much speculation. Let's just go with the text. He got drunk, and that's on him. Because he's a righteous man, he walks with God, but now he's drunk. And then he uncovered himself inside his tent. You do things when you're drunk that you don't do when you're sober. I've read about that. Okay. I've seen movies. But now Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Notice it's proprietary. It belongs to somebody, and it's not Ham. Okay. 
Noah's nakedness belongs to somebody and it's not Ham. It's Mrs. Noah is who owns Noah's nakedness. Rabbis also debated whether or not Mrs. Noah was in this story because uh, she is the, the nakedness of Noah. I'm going to talk about that, but that doesn't come about until Leviticus as a concept in any event. This is, this is a terrible story. So then he tells his two brothers outside, hey, guess what I saw? Come take a look, okay? I mean, you think about per perverts like to share their perversions, and, and it's, we're, we're, there's, you know, David's up on the roof, and apparently a whole staff of assistants and, and soldiers and servants, and who is that woman down there? And the servants are like, oh, that's Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife. And um, the, the, the guards were very skilled at identifying <laughs> women from the rooftop, I guess, but so Ham wants Shem and Japheth to come with him to go back in and repeat whatever it was that he did the first time he was in there. Okay? Which nobody can prove, but there's discussions. All right. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and walked backward, covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away they did not see their father's nakedness. Now this is, again, significant. And I think it's useful, too, that in these kind of realms, don't try and handle it by yourself. Get some help. Get a witness. Keep everything um, on, on, the, on the up and up. All right? They are not guilty. And they went the extra mile to demonstrate their reverence for their father's nakedness. And then when Noah woke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. <laughs> Don't ask. We'll get there, okay? There's tons of theories. And then there's what I find to be most likely. But Anyway, so from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3 to Genesis 9, we have a, we have a pretty, you know, we've got a variety of contexts related to nakedness. Sinless nakedness with no shame, sinful nakedness with fear, and then drunken nakedness that uh, actually tears a family apart, okay? And there's going to be judgment upon Ham and upon Canaan as, a, as an extension of, of Hamitic descent. That's it for Genesis. How about, uh, I mean, there's more. We could, I, I almost put in here uh, Mrs. Potiphar and her attempt to strip Joseph from, uh, from that, but he, he, he's a smart one, you know? Run, okay? Run. But I'm going to go to Leviticus. I'm approaching 12 o'clock, so now I've got to go faster. Leviticus 18. Leviticus is so useful in so many ways. Uh, our culture hates it and disputes everything that's in it. And they think that if you go to Leviticus, then you've just lost the debate. Because they'll throw it in your face and say, oh, are you quoting Leviticus? Do you eat bacon? And they'll say, I eat a lot of bacon. And yes, I'm quoting Leviticus. That's not a problem, okay? Because the dietary restrictions were removed in Christ, but the fornication is still fornication. Jesus never, uh, ne never ever abrogated the fornication portions of Leviticus, even when he was giving us permission to eat uh, bacon and pork and whatever else. But they, uh, they think they're so clever. And they say, oh, you're quoting Leviticus. Sometimes I'm tempted to hand him a Bible and say, show me Leviticus. See, see how long it takes him to find it. Anyway. Uh, we'll get past the first five verses here. We'll start with verse six. None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. All right, so we've got a couple of issues here. Not only do we have the, the naked vocabulary, but we have the principle of covering versus uncovering. Okay? The first thing Adam and Eve did in their shame and their fear as sinners, the first thing they wanted to do was cover. They wanted to cover their loins. They wanted to cover the shame of their nakedness. And so they chose the fig leaves. Why fig leaves? Probably it was a fig tree they ate from. Who knows? Okay? But it was no blood involved, and it was not God's provision for covering, so it was not acceptable. Anything you do in human effort is not acceptable. I don't care how attractive your fig leaves are. But there's the idea of approaching 
there's the idea of uncovering. And these, these principles get separated and they get repeated again and again and again and again. So much so that by the time you finish this tedious chapter, you're asking yourself, why? Because this is how our Father teaches us. It's tedious, but it's that repetition grinds it in and it pounds the point home. So if you've heard it a thousand times, that might be halfway enough to, to remember it. So none of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. Notice the uh, rules for what is acceptable or unacceptable sexual activity center in the existence of God himself, his nature. I am the Lord. So anytime a, a fornicator fornicates, he's attacking the nature of Yahweh. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. That is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You are not to uncover her nakedness. It's proprietary. You have a possessive pronoun. His nakedness, her nakedness, your nakedness. The nakedness belongs to... It's a, it's a, it's a proprietary issue. Okay? And our culture just blows that up. Okay? And yet, they'll paint signs. My body, my choice. Hold on. Okay? Proprietary nature of nakedness. Shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, it is your father's nakedness. The nakedness of your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether born at home or born outside, the nakedness, their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you shall not uncover, for their nakedness is yours. You're the, the begetter. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, born to your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Well, she had a different mother than I did. Doesn't matter. Same father. So these principles, and it's stated over and over and over and over again. The only nakedness you can uncover is when a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife in marriage. Then and only then do you have any business uncovering nakedness. All right, well, we can skip on down. This takes us down to verse 19. Your father's sister, your mother's sister, your father's brother shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. The nakedness of your daughter-in-law, she is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. So we understand the, the idiom, the expression. It's not just taking off clothes and looking. It's, it's the whole sexual activity. This is what man and woman do in marriage. But not before marriage. Not outside of marriage. So not marry a woman in addition to her sister. Of course, J Jacob was before this law was given, but, but he did. He married a woman and her sister. Look how much trouble that caused him. All right. Anyway. Down to chapter 20. A little bit redundant, but God's not above redundancy and repetition and bringing up a point again in a later chapter that he already covered in an earlier chapter. If there was a man who takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, so that he sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. They shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He bears his guilt. Notice who the accountable party is. It's the man in the situation. But cut off, that's capital punishment. This is a serious issue. A man who lies with a menstruous woman. So at that time of the month, she's off limits. For theological reasons, not for other things people think about. He covers her nakedness. He has laid bare her flow. She has exposed the flow of her blood. Thus both of them shall be cut off from among their people. Menstrual blood is doctrinal and it's supposed to teach principles in the Scripture. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or your father's sister. Blood relatives, they will bear their guilt. So you have this man of incest in 1 Corinthians 5 and the church is bragging about it because, you know, they're not legalists. <laughs> they're a grace ministry. No, you're a bunch of perverts. You should be faithful to the text. 
don't brag about your tolerance. They would have done well in 21st century American tolerant culture. All right. Now, what is this all about? Is this just because God's a fuddy-duddy? He doesn't want to have people to have fun? He's a stick in the mud. He's a curmudgeon. Come on. This is the 21st century. We're all liberated. We're, 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 we're uh, you know. No. This is for humanity's blessing and benefit. Because the soul damage that's done is so devastating. Absolutely devastating. So these principles have to be taught. And they have to be taught bluntly. And they have to be taught, um, and again, if, if, uh, if you're raising a young person and they're going to be married when they're 13 or 14, at what age do they learn this stuff? <laughs> okay? Important that they know this. Because God has designed marriage and family life for the, the greatest blessings we're going to have in Bios life. And yet we pervert it and, and do the damage that we end up doing. How about Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 20. I'm glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. You know, Isaiah was supposedly sawn in two. That was his martyrdom. But before that, something worse than that, um, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips and take your shoes off your feet. And he did so, going naked and barefoot. Even worse than... I, I have touchy feet, so to me, that, that barefoot part is, is maybe the worst part of all. Going naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign and a token against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush. They didn't have PowerPoint back then. They didn't have the, the, the computer displays. When, when God wanted to put something on display, this is how he did it. All kinds of ways. And Isaiah had to minister for three years naked the whole time. Every Sunday service, every message, go by for a hospital visit. Whatever it was Isaiah was doing in his ministry, he was naked for those three years. And this was a, a uh, object lesson. Because they're going to learn about their own captivity. The king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. This was the prophetic message, and Isaiah had to uh, endure the shame, despise the shame, and be seated, not like Jesus, of course, endure the cross, despise the shame, and was seated at the right hand of God. But Isaiah endured and despised, and uh, undoubtedly has tremendous treasure waiting him when he gets his eternal reward. Anyway, that's the object lesson in uh, Isaiah chapter 20. Running out of time, Ezekiel 16. Now before I get down to verses 35, we understand that the entire chapter has um, uh, language, metaphoric language, but it's useful as God speaks about Israel in their birth, Israel as a little girl. So let me, in the time that I have remaining here, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. Okay? Those are fighting words where I grew up. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it is kind of interesting to, uh, to think about the origins of, of the Jewish people. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing, uh, you were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. That's kind of a bad thing to happen if you're a newborn, if this is the day of your birth, and look how neglected. Look how, you know, a baby like this isn't going to live very long. It's just uh, abandoned. No eye looked with pity on you to do any of the things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out in the open field. You were abhorred on the day that you were born. And this was common in the ancient world, this was common in the classical world, this was common in the Roman world until Christianity started to take hold and affect the Roman culture. And biblical Christianity stopped the widespread exposure practice that the, the Romans were, just like everybody else, were uh, practicing in that day. When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. 
I said while you were in your blood, live. I made you numerous like the plants of the field. Then you grew up. You became tall. That's what happens. You have a baby. They don't stay babies. They grow. And then they reach an age. You grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine ornaments. You're not a baby anymore. You're not a toddler anymore. You're not a child anymore. Your body starts to go through these changes. We call puberty, adolescence, the changes. And all of a sudden, the child is now approaching marriage. Your breasts were formed. Your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Now, prior to this, a naked toddler's cute, a naked little kid, not a problem. But you reach a certain age, and now the covering becomes essential, becomes theological. I passed by and saw you. Behold, you were at, that you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and you entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Notice, first of all, there's the covering, because it's time for that now, and then there's the entering into marriage, the covenant. A man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife. Okay, This is the commitment. And I bathed you with water, washed off all your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with embroidered cloth, put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet, wrapped you with fine linen, covered you with silk. And husbands always want to, you know, you, you want to provide gifts for your wives and, and the, the clothing and the jewelry and the perfume and, and whatever. Things that she can be seen, on, seen in public and then other things that you keep at home. And, and you dress them and you undress them. All these things. This is, this is what God has designed for man and for woman. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands, a necklace around your neck. I put a ring in your nostril. Okay, some of this is cultural. We may or may not like the nose rings. Earrings in your ears, a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil, so you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. I really, it'd be kind of fun if the chapter just ended with verse 14 and they lived happily ever after. And Sadly, Israel as the wife of Jehovah played the harlot. After everything God did for Israel, she, she cheated. I mean, I hate even using the word cheated. That's a dumb word. She violated her marriage covenant vows. She committed adultery. She fornicated very flagrantly, very graphically. You trusted in your beauty and you played the harlot because of your fame. Wonder what the Bible describes as harlotry? Everything that's not in marriage. That means premarital is harlotry. Extramarital is harlotry. Whether you're getting paid for it or not is irrelevant. It's harlotry because it's outside of marriage. You poured out your harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. You know, don't need a name, you just need a place, and this looks good, and there you go. Anyway, I'm going to let you read the rest of this. Take it down. 35 through 43 is the specific verses talking about the nakedness, that she shared her nakedness with everybody under the sun, and Yahweh has given her over. She's going to go into captivity, where then there will be more nakedness of the captive. Um, Hosea chapter 2. Hosea had to marry a harlot. That was, that was, so Isaiah had to go naked. Hosea had to marry a harlot and have babies with her that he wasn't sure they were even his and then take her back. So read Hosea 2, 1 through 13. Read Matthew 25. Jesus uses this in the sheep and goat judgment. He says, I was naked and you clothed me. And then Revelation 3, 17, the church at Laodicea, they thought they were rich and in need of nothing. And Jesus tells them, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I think in every biblical passage as it relates to nakedness, we find principles, theological principles that we, we want to be aware of and we want to be very fearful over that we apply correctly with a reverence before the Lord, not just in our marriages, not just in our uh, family life and other things, but just in our, uh, if ever called upon, are we going to be Shem and Japheth? Are we going to have to step in and do something unpleasant? 
but yet we do so with like-mindedness and reverence and fear. If our brother has messed up, what are we going to do? Now, there's so many principles here that and I think, um, well, we just don't have time, but this is, uh, this is what we have for today. All right, we'll come back next week. We're into chapter 3, we'll deal with a Nahash, uh, an angelic being, not a zoological creature. But we'll, uh, we'll demonstrate that from the text. And, uh, and then we'll see the uh, sinless uh, Adam and Eve become the, the sinners that we all are. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for this doctrine. And Father, I thank you. We've got young people with us today, and they're learning these lessons and preparing themselves. The day will come that you will, you will bring them their marriage partners. And um, God, just pray, Father, that brothers and sisters with doctrine that can glorify you each step of the way. So thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being so real and revealing yourself to us in your word, in uh, touching every facet of our, of our uh, spiritual life and every facet of our temporal life, our home life, our sex life, our family life. Uh, the principles are found in your word, and I thank you for that. Mostly, Father, I want to thank you for my Savior. I want to thank you, Father, for the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross, taking my sin so that I can receive his righteousness. Father, it is a, it's a marvelous thing. Um, I just want to thank you as we depart, as we sing and depart. I want to thank you for Calvary. I thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, I picked out our hymn of the